you. We thank the co-chairs of the caucus, who are uh, Brian Milbray, Mike Castle, Jackie Spear, and Rush Holt, uh, for their ongoing commitment and dedication. I'd also like to thank the Howard Keats Medical Institute for its support of the caucuses through a generous grant. Truly, these briefings couldn't be held without them. Um, as you can see, we do videotape every brief, uh, every briefing. briefing. You can find uh, past briefings on our website at coalitionforlifesciences.org and register for our RSS feed. Um, now I'd like to turn this on to the important reason why we're here and introduce Dr. John Coffin today. Um, Dr. Coffin is one of the world's leading figures in the field of retrovirology. He revolutionized the study of retroviruses like HIV by uncovering a critical part of the mechanism that enables them to control their host cells. Dr. Coffin is the American Cancer Society professor and distinguished professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Microbiology at Tufts University. He is also past director of and advisor to the highly successful HIV drug resistance program at the National Cancer Institute, which he established in 1997. Currently, he divides his time between Tufts University and the NCI. He has served on a number of national committees to review and set policy regarding retroviruses and disease. <coughs> Pardon me. In 1999, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. He has written nearly 200 research articles um, and written and edited some of the best-known virology textbooks. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Dr. Kaufman. Thank you very much, Lynn. I'm really honored to be invited to address you on um, one of my favorite topics. I also, as she mentioned, work on HIV and AIDS, but I'm not going to talk to you about that at all. Um, instead, I want to talk to you about uh, a thread of research that's been going on in our laboratory at Tufts uh, ever since I started there a few years ago. And um, I will sort of try to kind of pick the plums from this research as I go along, since, of course, I don't have time to uh, give a, a really thorough going into it. Um, but I will happily entertain questions as I go along, or we can have some discussion at the end. I, I think there are lots of, uh, lot, lots of uh, interesting and important things to be learned from studying uh, the topic of this talk, that is to say, viruses in our genomes. Um, uh, validation of, of a sort for all of the uh, of, of the work and effort I and others uh, scientists had put into this over the years um, was finally achieved um, when um, <coughs> uh, the topic made it into an article in the New Yorker magazine a couple of years ago. So uh, this, this, when, when, when this happened, we knew we, we had finally become, at least in somebody's eyes, a little, at least a little bit cool. Um, and, uh, and that felt good. It's actually a very well-written article. It's worth going back and, and uh, reading it. Michael Spector is a very good science writer for The New Yorker. So w what are endogenous viruses? Well, retroviruses, as I will uh, tell you in a few minutes, are very common infections of very many animal species. They're probably um, as common uh, throughout the animal kingdom as infectious agents uh, as any other virus. Um, but they have a, a special property, and, and that I'll, which I'll discuss in detail in a few minutes, and that is that as a, as a normal part of the way these viruses replicate and grow in cells, they integrate, they insert their viral genetic information in the form of a DNA molecule, which we call a provirus, into the DNA of the cell. They have to do that. They don't replicate if they don't do that. If you block that, for example, you, some anti-HIV drugs, in fact, block that step, and they're very effective against in killing the virus. So, but once in a while, as I'll point out in detail again, the, um, uh, this infection can take place in a germline cell, in a sperm or an egg or, or a precursor to one of those during the course of development. And um, in that case, this DNA molecule, this provirus, can be established as a gene in that particular individual and then transmitted genetically to all of the offspring. And so endogenous retroviruses are remnants, they're the leftovers of these germline infections that have occurred in our very, perhaps our very distant ancestors, by infectious retroviruses. They become, some of them, only a small fraction of them actually become fixed in the host species. Most of the time that'll die out just by chance because your, your, your ancestors are only a tiny, tiny fraction of the total gene, of, of the total population that existed way in the distant past. So only a small fraction of, of, of any population is, gives rise to the, 
uh, subsequent generations. So most of the genes and the new genes they have get lost, but some of them don't. Some of them become what we call fixed. They actually by, uh, can spread, in a sense, through the population. Um, and so in part, some of that's because they do some good things. Some of them confer protection. They can help protect against future infection by the same or similar viruses. Um, a, few, a few others have different kinds of salutary effects, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Uh, they're inherited just like normal genes. Once they're in the DNA, they're just another piece of DNA for all practical purposes. Okay, they're, they're a virus genome, but they're in the DNA. The, every, every vertebrate examined, and many and perhaps all invertebrates, every animal uh, has traces of these, even if there's no obvious retrovirus infection in, in that particular species today. There was in some ancestor of it that got left behind. They comprise as much as 6 to 8 percent of the human genome. There are perhaps 80,000 different pieces in your DNA. Uh, that derive from uh, these retrovirus infections of, of our distant ancestors. And in fact, um, there are uh, only about 20,000 genes in the human genome. So there are several fold more uh, retroviruses in us than there is us in us. There's uh, one, way, one way of looking at that. Um, you may also be aware that if you take a, uh, if you take a person and break that person up into single cells, you get about tenfold more bacterial cells than you will human cells. So we're, we're much more microbe, in fact, than we are human. Um, at least that's one way, one way of looking at it. So um, importantly to us, endogenous retroviruses provide a, what's, what, a real fossil record of pathogen host interaction that's unavailable in any other system. We can look into our genome and we can look back, in a way, in, into what the viruses that were the, around in, um, in, in our ance in ancestral uh, species that were uh, host to these viruses. And so we can learn about these, and we can learn about the evolutionary processes uh, that have affected the virus-host relationship, and I'll talk about that some more. And we can also learn about um, evolutionary processes um, that may, that these provide particular models to study, even though they don't necessarily directly involve the viruses themselves. In some animals, uh, endogenous viruses come back up, uh, can re-arise from the genome, become a replicating virus that gets passed around the cells of an animal and actually cause disease. In humans, we don't, we don't yet know, and I'll, I'll return to this very briefly at the very end, we don't yet know if that's happening. It's, um, we don't see uh, the kind of, if you like, live viruses. Uh, in our genome that you see in mice, for example, or chickens or some other species, but this is still an object of intense study and, and interest. So um, I put up a couple of slides here to sort of illustrate the, the, the thinking that, that we have about the evolution of viruses and hosts and of retroviruses in their hosts. Um, I also put it up to illustrate my, um, my consummate skill as a commu uh, computer graphics artist. So, for the most part, the endpoint of virus evolution, virus host coevolution, and viruses and hosts, their hosts coevolve over the ages, is a fairly benign one. You can tell because these guys are all smiling, uh, despite the fact that they're infected with some virus or another. Um, but that, that coadaptation also often involves special features of, of the genetics of both the host and the virus, so that if this virus is transmitted to another host um, and spreads through that host, uh, in fact, it can be the cause of considerable morbidity or even, even mortality in a different species. And this is a fairly common story. Um, with time, um, some individuals will survive either because they become, uh, they, they get selected for resistance to the virus for one reason or another, um, or because they have, they, they, they and the virus take on this kind of co-adaptation and the virus be association becomes benign. This actually can take a very long time to, to accomplish. Many many uh, thousands or millions of generations and many uh, millions of years, perhaps. And uh, the virus is either eliminated from the host or uh, stays on as a relatively benign association, recapitulating what we saw up here. But if this virus gets passed again to another species, you'll get the same uh, morbidity, the illness and death um, that you would. And this would be a good example of this right now would be Ebola virus, for example, where Ebola virus is probably very well adapted and quite benign in bats, but occasionally gets transmitted to chimpanzees and humans with, with devastating consequences that I'm sure you've all read about in the papers from time to time. Now, retroviruses have, because of their ability to form proviruses, uh, permanent DNA elements, retroviruses have a special property. 
Um, and I'll just illustrate here, here's a virus, here's a, here's a cell somewhere in the body, a somatic cell, not a germ cell, so this could be a blood cell or a brain cell or anything. The virus infects this, the genome gets copied into a molecule of DNA. Now I always draw proviruses with these two boxes at the ends, and those indicate structures called long terminal repeats at the ends of the DNA, and these are identical sequences that the virus makes for its own reasons um, to help in, in replication. I won't go into the, the reasons for this. They um, have the property, the useful property that the time of integration, uh, time of, that they're made, they have to be identical to one another from the way they're made. And, um, and then you get integration of this DNA molecule somewhere, at, more or less at random in the cell DNA. There's billions of possible integration sites in our cell DNA, um, and that's important for some of the arguments I'm going to give you later on. And so this, uh, this structure, as I said, is called a provirus. It stands for the virus, in a sense. And, um, and it has these identical uh, long terminal repeats at the end. The provirus then acts like it's a cellular gene. It, it directs the synthesis of all of the proteins and all the components uh, necessary to make more virus. That virus can go on and then repeat, infect another cell and repeat the cycle over and over again until all the cells in the body or all the susceptible cells are infected. And um, the endogenous proviruses are formed the same way in a germ cell or a precursor to a germ cell. If, if one of those cell types gets infected, say a sperm, a sperm or, or a precursor to an egg, and then that uh, cell gets fertilized to become a zygote, and it now has the provirus in it. Now all of the cells um, have that provirus at the same site of integration. Once the virus is integrated, it can't be removed, it can't move. That, that site of integration, that exact site of integration, remember there are billions of possible sites of integration, remains exactly the same. And uh, that then gets um, all of the cells of the developing embryo have this, and it eventually gets um, into all of the cells of the offspring. If this offspring then goes on to have more, uh, more generations and founds new generations, then all of them have this endogenous provirus at the same place. So the host retrovirus evolution uh, can look a little bit different because of this. You can have the same kind of benign association. For example, many rel close relatives of HIV have a very benign association with their natural host um, at, in, of various African uh, primates uh, of one kind or another. And um, this can then spread, uh, but if it spreads into a new host, then you can have the same kind of morbidity and mortality. But what can happen is that somewhere in this new host you can get uh, formation of endogenous provirus, and that may actually participate in eradicating the infection from this host so that now all of the descendants, because this one guy is not infected, infectable by this virus, this guy does better and our, um, the virus uh, gets eradicated, or the virus gets eradicated for another reason, but this just happens to, this provirus just happens to come along. But so now even through the course, this is now not virus transmission, but evolution, this will stay through the course of evolution because DNA over evolutionary time changes very, very slowly. This only accommodate, uh, only a, D, your DNA only accommodate, accumulates a few mutational changes per million years. Um, and so this is a very slow change. So this can remain as a fossil record of the in infection that went on in our very, very distant ancestors. And I'll show you how that plays out with some specific examples. So endogenous proviruses, in, in, when they find their way into the DNA, actually have had a number of both good and bad effects. I'll show you one bad effect here. Uh, this is a mouse that's inherited a virus called mouse mammary tumor virus that, um, um, uh, that if it gets loose, it replicates around the mouse. It can then find its way at some, in, in occasional cells at, at a position where it will actually turn on a gene that will cause that gene to become a cancer gene, and this mouse will then uh, suffer from this mammary carcinoma and eventually die of it. Uh, th this is a mouse uh, called hairless, and this mouse is, has, and I'll come back to this, but this hairless gene uh, was disrupted by the insertion of a provirus into it, so this mouse now um, no longer uh, has hair for most of its life. Um, and a couple of good things. Um, this, this provirus was integrated, uh, endogenous provirus, in, in an ancestor of humans and chimpanzees uh, next to a gene that codes for amylase. Um, amylase digests starches into simple sugars. This one is, um, this gene is ordinarily expressed in the pancreas. In humans, however, this provirus directs its expression in the salivary gland. 
And, and because of these, uh, the, the transcriptional, the, the, the signals in these long terminal repeats that, that tell us via this gene to be expressed in the salivary gland, as a result of this, starches to humans, but not necessarily to other species, uh, taste somewhat sweet. And this may, in fact, have to do with our penchant for eating grains and, um, and starches as opposed to just gathering fruits and nuts. And you could go on to argue, if you really want to get um, far-fetched on this, that this has a lot to do with our cultural evolution, our sedentary types, our agriculture, and everything else, was because of the, we can trace back to this provirus that was integrated um, into uh, this specific gene uh, millions of years ago. And finally, another case of a captured function from the virus, Retroviruses have a gene called ENV, which stands for envelope. The purpose of this gene is to interact with the cell surface, fuse the virus and the cell together so that the virus can start the replication cycle. So this gene has that fusion function. Well, in humans and actually a number of other species, that fusion function in an endogenous provirus has been captured so that it now forms a very important role, and that is to fuse together the cells that exist at the surface of the placenta, so that these cells now are no longer as individual cells. They're all fused together in one cell, with all, see all these nuclei all together in one cell. That forms a solid impermeable barrier around the, uh, around the placenta of the growing fetus and prevents toxins and viruses and other bad things from getting through from the maternal situ uh, circulation. And in, in humans, in mice, and in, in um, uh, goats at least, and sheep, this, this gene has been captured from a virus that allows this fusion to occur. Without that, uh, our development would probably be much, uh, much less efficient and effective than it is and, uh, because we would lack this, this important barrier. So, um, so I want to talk a, 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 for a few minutes about some studies that we had done that lays the groundwork for some of the human studies I'll talk about toward the end of endogenous retroviruses in mice. Mice, as I'm sure you know, um, have been bred into a lot of strains, and, and uh, we know a lot about the genes and, and, and genetics and, and mutations in mice, and they've been extremely valuable for being able to do simple breeding studies in a laboratory to identify genes important um, in many different kinds of diseases. I want to show you one bit of technology so you to understand this, and that's how we detect uh, proviruses um, in mice or in humans, how we detect endogenous proviruses. So we have a piece of DNA that just comes out of the genome. We just take whole d DNA from cells. Uh, any cell in the body this could be because they, they all have the same provirus. Here's a provirus with the LTRs at the ends, as I mentioned before. We cut this DNA to, now, now the, the question is here, we, wanted to, we have numerous proviruses in us and in mice that are very, very similar to one another. That, but there are different positions. And we want to be able to identify and distinguish a provirus that's one place in the genome from one that's in another. The trick, the trick that uh, we use to do that um, is called a blot hybridization, or sometimes a southern blot hybridization, not because it's done in the south, but because it was Ed Southern was the fellow that devised this. Um, and we digest the DNA with a, with a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme is an enzyme that cuts at a specific short DNA sequence, four bases or six bases, and it will cut DNA into lots and lots of pieces, millions of pieces. And so the trick is now to identify the piece that has that particular that, that, that is characteristic for this particular provirus. And a characteristic piece is identified by having a, a position for cutting here, a site here, and then a site somewhere in the outside DNA, okay? And the position of this site will vary, will be the same with all of these proviruses. This one will vary according to where the, where the DNA happens to have been integrated. So every provirus of a given type will have a specific characteristic fragment. We call it a junction fragment that distinguishes it from all of the others, even if they're identical in between. And then we use a hybridization probe, which is a small piece of DNA which is complementary to a specific sequence within the, within the provirus and will hybridize only to that. This is radio labeled. We then, we cut the DNA, we run it out on a, uh, by electrophoresis to separate all of these size fragments. So we get these bands and each band will represent a specific provirus. We hide to detect these bands, we hybridize it. Um, with this label, radio label probe, we expose it to x-ray film, and so you can see these patterns that, that develop. And so um, each characteristic in each provirus has a specific size that goes with it, 
and we can use that size then to tag and to name the provirus. And this just shows what happens with inbred strains of mice. Inbred strains of mice, as I'm sure you're aware, derived by brother-sister mating until all of the mice, for many generations, until all of the mice are identical. They're all like Every mouse of a strain, every, every um, black six or C57 or AKR is identical to every other one. Okay? And so that, this is what provides the genetic power of working with mice. And so you can see that each of these strains has a somewhat different pattern of proviruses, although some are common across others. We use three different probes here. Um, I'm not going to go into what these are. These just detect close relatives that, that based on small differences in their sequence. And you can see that you can tell one strain from another very nicely with this, and you can identify these. And then you can do experiments, for example, like crossing two of these and then crossing them again and looking among the progeny at where, which, how these proviruses segregate, segregate among the descendants. And you can use that for classical genetic, to do classical genetic mapping. And when we, do, when we did that, we in fact identified that these proviruses, as, which are these various uh, dots on this, on this plot, this is a mouse genetic map, these are mouse chromosomes 1 through, one through 19, and we could identify these proviruses mapping all over the genome at random positions. Uh, more or less, as we might have expected, but it was nice to be able to see that. Um, having all of, this, all of these um, proviruses mapped all over the genome allowed us to ask uh, some straightforward questions about whether, for example, uh, these were involved in some of the mutations that people were interested in. Remember, landing a provirus into a gene, a provirus is a good-sized chunk of DNA. If that lands into a gene, that gene will no longer work. It will disrupt that gene and um, will um, will cause a, a clearly visible mutation in the mouse. So, um, so we went and, and tried to see whether any of these mutations were, any of the mutations that are known in mice were in fact associated with these. And here's a collection of mice um, of various kinds of what we thought were mutants at the time that, that uh, a graduate student of mine had found for sale in Thailand. And we thought we, were, you know, we, could, we could map the purple gene and the green gene and so on and so forth. That turned out not to work. These mutations didn't, well, these quote mutations didn't survive uh, very long after we brought them back to the lab. However, we did identify this one, which is a picture I showed you before, of this um, hairless mouse. Um, and we could prove, basically, that that mouse was caused, that mutation was caused by the insertion of the proviruses, which is marked right by this band here. The, these two mice are, are siblings. This mice has only a single copy, you actually can't see it there, of this provirus. And this one has two copies. And, uh, we were able to prove genetically with some more experiments that, in fact, this mutation, had, which was discovered um, in an aviary in London by running across the floor by a night watchman um, who brought it home, made a pet of it, and then it eventually got uh, br bred into, uh, into an inbred strain. And um, we were able to clone this, identify the gene, the hairless gene that goes with it. And that sub same gene was later on found by people to be associated with a human disease, with a, which had almost exactly the same characteristics. These people were born with normal amounts of hair, but they then uh, lose them at a very early age the same, way, uh, the same way the mice do. And that turned out to be in exactly the same gene, although this was ca not caused by a virus. It was caused by a mutation. Another uh, place where uh, endogenous murine leukemia viruses have been recently in the news that you may have heard about is a virus called XMRV. And that um, is, um, was uh, reported in a paper um, in science less than a year ago um, by uh, Lombardi et al. Um, to be associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, the first author was heard to say XMRV isn't everything, it's the only thing. Um, some of the older ones may recognize that quote. Um, and um, XMRV um, then was a virus actually first described about four years ago in a few patients with prostate cancer. Within the last year, it's been found in, 25, in another paper in 25% of prostate cancer, 67% of chronic fatigue syndrome. A number of normal controls in both studies, suggesting that the, the number of people infected with this virus may be very high. And it, but several other studies have not found it. And this, this, this actually remains quite controversial. This is something that you may want to keep an eye on, in fact, the developments in this particular field. This might be a very important virus. Um, we just don't know yet. It is a real virus, but um, the human association has been challenged um, in, in more recent studies, particularly some studies from Europe that have not, not have seen the same, have not seen the same kind of association. Anyway, taking these at face value, the isolates from the two diseases at different times and locations are almost identical to one another. 
As I said, the causality, prevalence, and distribution of this virus remain to be established. But the interesting thing for our purpose at the moment, this virus is very closely related to endogenous murine leukemia viruses, some of the same viruses that I was just showing you um, in these other studies. And so what we imagine has happened to give rise to this virus eventually is way back, this would be on the order of a million years ago in mice, some, some murine leukemia viruses um, were uh, infecting mice. Some of these became endogenous by, by uh, integrating DNA into the germline, as I mentioned, and that could then be passed both by inheritance and by transmission as a virus. And then, subsequent to that, and be probably because of pressure put on by this virus, there was a mutation in the receptor of the cells in, in these mice that's necessary for, um, for this virus to infect. So the virus that's in there now was locked in there, could no longer could no longer escape and replicate in this mouse, but it could still replicate in other species. So this is passed now only by inheritance in the mouse, but it looks like sometime fairly recently, this virus, which is called xenotropic MLV-related virus, a horrible acronym, but there it is, um, was transmitted to humans and has either been transmitted from human to human or is repeatedly transmitted from mice to humans, and we just don't know that yet. Okay, we, we, there's an awful lot we don't know about this virus. Um, so you just have to watch this space over the next few years and, and um, as, as this story gets worked out. But this, these viruses, these are all of the different isolates from chronic fatigue syndrome or prostate cancer of this virus. This just shows the sequence of these viruses as related in this family tree to these other um, endogenous mouse viruses, some of which are the, were, were in the bands in the gels that I showed you before. And this is a very close relationship. If you were to take HIV, an HIV-infected individual, for example, and look at the different viruses just within that individual, you would see that they differed, they, they looked something like this as far as their difference from one another. So these viruses are very, very similar to one another, and um, that remains also a subject of, of great interest for understanding this virus. All right, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about us and, and, and other primates. Um, so here's a bunch of primates, and one of my favorite primates, Jen Hughes, who did a lot of the experiments I'm going to, a lot of experiments on this, a few of which I'm going to show you. So endogenous proviruses um, can serve as valuable evolutionary markers not only for virus evolution, but um, uh, because they represent unique and irreversible mutations. Once a provirus is in the DNA, it's there forever. There's no way that it comes out. It can be modified somewhat in interesting ways, but it doesn't, you can always tell it's there um, in, the, in the genome, and that's why we have 80,000 of these in our genes still around uh, to look at. So, and because the integration, as I said, is random and the genome is so big, um, if you see the an integration in the same place in two different people or in two different species, in humans and chimpanzees, for example, that means that the provirus, that the virus that gave rise to that must have been around in a common ancestor of e you or me or of humans and chimpanzees or whatever. There's no way this could happen by chance. It's just too improbable. So these can be used to provide important evolutionary information. We can estimate the time of integration, and I'll show you this in a second. We can use that to, to detect and quantitate various kinds of evolutionary events that have happened. How, how the genome, what, what things have happened to rearrange the genome, to change the genome, to cause evolution to occur, kinds of mutations or rearrangements of the DNA. Um, and uh, we can also detect various kinds of recombination events, as I'll, sh I'll show you an example of that in a second. So here's a, a very standard phylogeny of, of primates. Primates are divided into old world and new world uh, monkeys, or squirrel monkey, owl monkey, and a bunch of others here. I only have the one. And then the old world monkeys can further be divided into hominids, uh, humans, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, as well as other uh, non-hominid um, old world monkeys, African green monkeys and so on, baboons. Um, I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with this. Now, if a provirus integrates, at a sp had, has integrated at some point that's a common ancestor to hominids but not to other species, so sometime within the, in this lineage within a range of 18 to 30 million years, then that will be found in all of the descendants of that, um, of, of the species that existed then that was the ancestor. And so from the species distribution and the fact that there's, you can see this common integration site, and what's important is to identify this identical integration site in all of these different species, and we have good ways of doing that. Um, 
then that tells us that this provirus has to have been around more than 18 million, and probably the, the absence from here suggests, would suggest less than 30 million years ago. On the other hand, if a provirus integrated um, within this range and into an ancestor of old world primates, then in fact it'll be found in all of these species, and we can know then that this has been around for more than 30 million years. And there are a lot that we know that in fact have been around for this period of time. With, with an exception I'll mention at the very end, we don't know if this is true uh, for any other infectious agent. People who work on, say, pox viruses get very excited when they find evidence of smallpox in, 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 in Egyptian mum, monkey, uh, mummies. Now that's only a few thousand years old. We're talking 30 million years here. And there's some evidence of proviruses. They, they get hard to see, harder to see as time goes on because they get eroded by the sands of time. They keep accumulating mutations and things jump into them and things get rearranged and they get harder and harder to detect. But there's some evidence that there are some that can be detected. There's certainly some that are common to New World and Old World monkeys, making them older than 45 million years ago. And there's some evidence that some can be detected even much older than that. So retroviruses, and these viruses don't look any different really in any significant way than do the viruses that we have around today. It's like finding a fossil mouse, for example. It's not exactly the same as any of the species of mice that we have around, but you can tell very well it's a mouse and it has nothing, nothing different about it. And you wouldn't be surprised to find it around. The same thing is true of these very old viruses. So retroviruses were, have been around for a very long time, probably much, much longer than this. Retrovirus evolution was probably long over essentially at this point. You could probably go back Take a, take a needle, pull a fly out of, blood out of a fly that's locked in amber, uh, find the dinosaur DNA in that, and find endogenous viruses in the dinosaur DNA, if it were in fact possible to do that kind of science fiction experiment. It'd be a lot easier to do that than to try to resurrect the whole dinosaur, I would say. And, um, <coughs> and so this is already something very important that we've learned from looking at these, and that is the age of these viruses. Um, so, uh, let me say one other thing. When evolutionary biologists, evolutionary biologists like to take trees like this and make clocks. Because they, the, the, the branches on these trees are a measure of the number of changes that have to have occurred in the genome, in the genomes, in the genes that we're looking at uh, that are just occurring pretty much at random, random changes, okay? So clocks like these, um, if, you, if you make a clock like these looking at these, at virus genes, you in fact estimate that these viruses, not necessarily these, have, have uh, only evolved very, very recently. The, these clocks, it turns out, are very much in error. In fact, people have estimated that all retroviruses, evolutionary biologists, of which I'm not one, um, evolutionary biologists looking at HIV and variation in HIV made a clock and came to the conclusion that all retroviruses, uh, of which there are many different types, are only 2,000 years old. There's a common ancestor of all retroviruses only 2,000 years ago. By looking at this fossil record, we were able to find that this was an error by at least a factor of 10,000. Even for an evolutionary biologist, this is a rather large error. Um, and the reason is that um, the reason is that the clocks make certain assumptions about the role of uh, the relative roles of mutation and selection and other events in the course of, of evolution. And those assumptions clearly are, are actually fairly accurate if you're looking at are our genes and the genes and sequences in, in DNA of animals, but if you're looking at sequences in viruses, they're just completely inaccurate. There's just no, no clocking of viruses, and that's become more and more apparent as, as time has gone on. So I want to talk about one specific group of, of endogenous viruses, a group called HERV-K. Um, HERV stands for Human Endogenous Retrovirus. Uh, I, I, K is because it has a lysine <coughs> tRNA. That's not important at all for us. Um, these are, were first detectable uh, more than 30 million years ago uh, because we can, find, we can find proviruses of this group that are present in all old world monkeys. So, so somewhere along in here, but not new world monkeys. So somewhere along in here, um, this must have, um, this, this, these, in, in, this virus, the virus that gave rise to this must have existed. Um, this, however, is also the virus um, that is most of some members of this group have, have integrated relatively recently in our genome, within the last few hundred thousand years. So they're found in humans, but not in chimpanzees, for example. And this is the only group of viruses that has this property that we know of that's found in humans and not in chimpanzees. And there are about 30 to 50 full-length proviruses. This is about the same numbers as were in the mice that I showed. Um, in some, 
you can actually find these, the, the, the viruses that go with this. None of them is completely infectious. They all have some, some, something wrong with them somewhere. But some of them are good enough that, that you can see RNA or you can see actually nice looking viruses. In normal placenta, for example, you can see, you can almost always see um, virus particles that come from, uh, from one, of the, one or more of these proviruses. And so um, with the, one of the most valuable things to us of the enormous effort to generate the sequence of the human genome and now many other animals, um, one of them was we, we had the ability then to go fish out all the proviruses uh, of this group from this and so we were able to, um, uh, to find a large number of these. And so we were able to use these uh, to learn various things about how this virus has evolved and has co-evolved with us. So we were able to estimate, for example, the age of these proviruses uh, from not only because we can estimate the age in two ways. One is by looking, as I said, at the species distribution. So if it's found only in humans and chimpanzees, for example, it's probably integrated somewhere between 6 and 10 million years ago before gorillas, after gorillas branched off. But also because with time, genomes accumulate mutations. It's a very slow pro process, but changes, changes slowly occur. And the, the LTRs are identical when integration occurs, but they accumulate changes independently of one another. And so we can use the difference between them also to make a kind of a clock going back, a more reliable clock than the kind I just told you. And so we can use that to check its age. We can check on the phylogeny of the host species. Um, and we can also detect various kinds of recombination events. And I'll just show you this one um, uh, as, uh, as an example of what we found. So you have two chromosomes in, um, in, in, a, um, in a germ cell, for example, two different, two different chromosomes in two different places. These have, each of these chromosomes has a provirus on it, okay? And that pro, these two proviruses are the same or very similar to one another. Well, similar sequences on chromosomes can serve as sites for, for crossing over. So during replication, as an error sometimes, the replication machinery can jump from one sequence here to the, the identical sequence here and then keep on going. It's a little bit like if you're reading a book and you come to a sentence and that sentence is repeated on the next page, every once in a while you might actually jump to the next page and, and lose the whole, lose everything in between. Well, the DNA machinery can every once in a while do that. It's very rare, but it can do it. And in that case, you will get a crossing over here and so you will get, um, you'll get now um, where is this goes from blue chromosome into the provirus then, then, um, and then becomes red chromosome. And so all of the, 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 the corresponding portions of the chromosome will come along. But we can detect this event because these, pro, these LTRs no longer match properly. And we, so we can see that as mismatched, as mismatched LTRs um, in, the, in these proviruses. And we found that in about six out of 36 that we examined in this particular case. And this, um, so this has been an important element in, in, um, in the rearrangement of chromosomal DNA in our evolution. Rearrangement of chromosomal DNA has a number of consequences. For example, it's evolved in speciation because if chromosomes don't match from one individual to another, then that, that pair is no longer fertile and, um, and they can go on their way to start separate species. Okay, so that's one thing that can happen and other kinds of things can happen as well. Um, but from the combined age of these proviruses and from the frequency of this, we estimate that these crossovers are not very common. They occur at a rate about once every 80 million years. That's, that's pretty low rate, but we have, this gives us a very sensitive and powerful way to detect these kinds of important events in our evolutionary past. So the final thing I want to talk about is the distribution of these proviruses and their possible association with genetics in, in humans. Remember, I, I showed you patterns like this for mice. These are now, instead of being different inbred strains of mice, these are different humans that are uh, probed in the same way looking for, um, for different HERV-K provirus. So each of these bands represents a different provirus. As you can see, humans are much more homogeneous in these proviruses than were inbred mice with the viruses I showed you before, where there's a lot of variation from one to another. And that reflects the fact that most of these um, integrations occurred a long time ago, long enough ago that basically they, we, they have become fixed in, in, the, in the genome, which means that, that uh, they, they, they go back to 
uh, time when all of us are descended from one, from one person, at least at this particular point in DNA. We may be descended from somebody else at a piece of DNA over here, but at this one place of DNA, we all have exactly the same ancestor, perhaps four or five, three, four, five million years ago, um, with a few exceptions. And you can see fairly easily there's one there, one there, there, uh, there, and you, uh, that indicate integrations that have occurred much more recently, and these are with, probably within the last few hundred thousand years. And there may be much more recent ones than that, and our lab is ongoing, has ongoing work to try to find them. But the, um, so some individuals actually seem to have rather large numbers of these so-called polymorphic proviruses, the ones that vary. Um, ordinarily, of course, this, I, I, uh, the human subjects um, uh, for, completely forgives me, research laws completely for, forbid me from, from revealing uh, the identity of any of these people, but I have a special dispensation on this one. Um, and, um, there, there may, in fact, be uh, some relationship between one's interest in virus and the number of proviruses that one carries around. We're still trying, trying to research that um, by getting samples from other virologists, for example. Um, and, so, um, and so our lab is quite interested in whether these cause disease. So to conclude, in humans, there's, there's much, almost to conclude, there's much less evidence for recent activity of endogenous proviruses than there is in mice. Nevertheless, I, I, think, that's, I think that's just chance. There's this back and forth that goes on. Viruses come in. They die out, they come in, they die out. And I think, I, I think we're just looking at different periods in the evolution of different species by, to get to see these differences in the number of proviruses. In, in koalas, for example, there now is a, a raging infection of some of these murine leukemia virus like viruses that's going in, becoming endogenous, actually causing it's devastating to the, to the species. Um, and that's, this is something that's only happened in the last few hundred years, probably. And they, they have come in probably because of animals that came into Australia with humans pass the viruses on, but, but that's ongoing right now. It's not ongoing as far as we can tell in humans, although there might be a little bit of low activity. Uh, it is ongoing in mice and chickens and some other species. Nevertheless, there have been a few insertions in the last few hundred thousand years, and some may be still capable of infection, although none of the ones that we've seen, that you saw in those bands probably, and we're, we are looking for these. And are any of these still associated with disease? This virus is expressed, I mentioned before, in breast cancer, for example. Does that have anything to do with the disease? And we're working on that right now. One more surprise, and within the last year, it was discovered that we, in addition to retroviruses, which have this special kind of replication machinery, also evidence for non-retroviruses getting into our DNA. A group of viruses called bornaviruses, which causes neurological disease in a number of different species, including mice, and maybe in humans. This is still controversial. Um, and these got put in not because this is a normal part of their replication cycle, but because there's machinery in all of in 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 cells for uh, moving around other kinds of things called transposable elements, and uh, some of these happen to get caught up with this machinery. And these also demonstrate the great age of these viruses that look again like they're rapidly evolving to a um, to a molecular uh, phylogenetics uh, a um, to a molecular clock expert. Um, and it may be that some of these also provide useful functions. That remains to be seen. So I'll close here. Um, I will um, thank a long list of people from my lab who have who've participated in this work and also show you this lovely scene of the, is anybody here from Massachusetts? There you go. Hey, so this is our, we have a cranberry bog in South Carver, which you probably know, it's about 50 miles away, and this shows one of the most beautiful sites in agriculture, the, uh, the, uh, the, the cranberry harvest. There's about 25 million cranberries floating on this piece of bog right now, uh, ready to be pumped up into a truck, uh, taken off and made into craisins and cranberry juice and stuff. Thank you very much. Can you go back to the conclusion slide? Sure. For a moment? Sure. Thanks. I think these will be online too, of course. Oh, okay. I'll get the website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that mean because you're designing the, all of those to hybridize or whatever, does that mean you have to know what proviruses you're looking for? You have to know the sequence, yeah. So, okay, so you can't this detect is, proviruses that. You, you, can work, you can work back and forth a little bit. You can look for things that are related to things you know about by uh, doing hybridizations at lower stringency, which means they'll detect things that are somewhat more distantly related. You can then find those, use that to clone those. 
and, um, and then use those sequences to generate new oligos. We've done a lot of that kind of sort of bootstrapping of this, starting with a sequence of a virus that you know, and then kind of working up to understand, to, to get at these better. More, more commonly now, uh, what you do is you just go, uh, you do it all computationally because there's so many genome sequences. You just go, you can go into the genomes and their algorithms for searching for things that look like viruses or that might be a little bit related to what you're looking for. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of ways you can do that now that, that uh, weren't, certainly weren't available to us when we started this off many years ago. Now, it seems that the Australian Red Cross has uh, regulated that no uh, blood donations can come from people with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, maybe due to a, a link, possible link to this right. XML RV. Um, do you think that's sort of a, uh, are they sort of just over-exaggerating the link there, or do you think that this might catch on in other countries? I think it'll probably catch on. I, there's, there's certainly talk in the U.S. of, uh, uh, there's certainly talk of voluntary of, of um, people with chronic fatigue syndrome, no matter whether they feel well or, or, or ill at the moment, uh, for deferring themselves from blood donation. Um, whether or not XMRV is the cause of this, um, it, the, the, the disease in many ways looks like an infectious disease. It, it, um, even, so even if it's not XMRV, there may be some other infectious agent that could be transmissible through the blood supply involved. Um, studies have not revealed a real smoking gun in transmissibility the way they did with HIV, for example, when it became very obvious very fast that HIV was being transmitted through the blood supply. That doesn't mean it's not happening at a low rate, that the studies just haven't been extensive enough to reveal yet. Um, so certainly caution, even, even if XMRV turns out not to be correct, uh, prudence might well dictate. I mean, I'm not. I'm involved in some of the studies that will provide data for making some of these decisions, but I'm not involved in making these decisions myself. So. But um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at, at least a very strong suggestion were put up, if not an actual uh, ban on, 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 on donations by chronic fatigue patients. I don't think the same thing will ever happen with prostate cancer, but yeah. I'm to, I believe it was for her mm -hmm. X, XMR, you think of XMRG or um, which, which the mouse, the, 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 uh, the uh, we don't know that those viruses cause any, that particular, we don't know that that particular virus causes any disease in mice. However, viruses that are very closely related to it uh, cause a lot of different kinds of disease in mice. Cancer, immunodeficiency diseases, neurological diseases, and, and, and others. Uh, so it's not impossible that it does, okay? Uh, we, that virus is, is what I mentioned is a xenotropic virus that doesn't replicate in mice, so it can't cause disease in mice. Um, it's been associated with, with the two diseases in humans, prostate cancer in, in uh, up to a quarter of cases in some studies but not other, and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, again in some studies and not others, and we still have to sort out what the difference is, is between those studies. Is it the way they're looking? Is it the, is it the cohort of patients they're looking at? We, this hasn't been resolved. These things can be very difficult to, to work out, and it's only been a short, it's only been a short time. Uh. And, and the um, problem with the virus that when they, when you got them back to the state, was, that, that was a little joke, actually. Oh. We didn't, they were for sale in a marketplace in Thailand. Um, the, uh, they're, they're died, of course. I mean, it's like it, it's like it's like chicks. It's like chicks at Easter, you know. Okay. Once the once the feathers grow out, they're no longer the color they once were. I'm actually going to make part statement, but also part question for you. A little bit of time. Um, clearly, this is work that only NIH or, in general, NIH would be supportive of since it's, it's very basic. But can you take us through how long from when they started looking at? at this science to where we got to where there's sort of a breakthrough in understanding the coronavirus and the XMRV and Well, I mean, we research, research on retroviruses in particular um, as a major, uh, a significant focus of NIH uh, research goes back to the 60s. Um, I was a graduate student with Howard Temin who was 
um, one of the uh, co-discoverers of, of reverse transcriptase, which was dis discovered basically how retroviruses are different from everything else and how they replicate. Um, and um, uh, he was one of the sort of very early scientists studying. So he, I'm in the, kind of the second generation of people who've been well, you know, whose work has been supported by an age to study these. Um, studying of retroviruses over the years um, not only did two, well, did a number of important things. I think this is one of them, but it's not the one, one of the ones I'm going to list. One is, one is it, it really led to the, the basic groundwork for understanding, understanding cancer. None of the other systems that were being looked at at the time um, really provided the insight into cancer for causation that retroviruses did. And that's because retro, I didn't talk about this at all, but retroviruses can um, pick up uh, genes called oncogenes into, into the virion and, and then pass them on and, and pass them on from one cell to another in an experimental setting. And because there are only three or four genes in a retrovirus, an oncogene is only one of three genes. In a, tr in a, in a cancer cell, it's one of 20,000 genes. And you can't tell which one it is in any easy way. In a virus, it's easy to see it there and it's easy to find it and it's easy to eventually to work out what it does. And that, well, that's why Mike Bishop won the Nobel Prize, for example, was for doing exactly that. And, um, and Harold Varmus. And uh, the other thing is that all of that research um, laid uh, very important groundwork so that we could move very rapidly uh, when the AIDS epidemic struck, identify HIV, develop tests for it, um, uh, under, and begin to understand how it worked and develop antiretroviral drugs, which have been, well, extremely important. If we didn't have antiretroviral drugs in the, in the U.S. now, I can't imagine what it would be like. In fact. Um, uh, you'd, we'd probably be, uh, be you know, you'd, it'd be awful. <laughs> it's just the way, the way people were infected with HIV would be treated and so on and so forth. And the way they still are, of course, in Africa where, where antiretroviral drugs are not very common. And, and um, this kind of research, met much of it extremely basic. I mean, we're talking about viruses in chickens and mice originally. Uh, causing cancer in chickens and mice, not in humans. None of, the, none of these early work, none of this early work was done in humans until, until the 80s, until 15 years or more after the work had been supported. Was there really any research in human retroviruses? And then, of course, the AIDS epidemic burst on the scene. So um, the research that was supported by NIH for all that time, really, without that, I, I can't imagine where, where we would be in our understanding of these diseases and the development of treatments and and tests and so on and so forth. In parallel, of course, there's been an enormous body of other kinds of science that have contributed to this. The development of genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, for example, uh, is moving very fast. It'll be possible. Um, it's almost possible now to go into a doctor's office, have a sample of DNA taken, and, and uh, get your genome sequenced for, for diagnostic purposes. We're not quite there. It's not quite to that, but I don't think it, I think it will be, that will be a diagnostic modality for some things within five years or so. Um, and all of that, of course, contributes to very much to our ability to be able to find, find viruses in DNA, because we have the sequences of the DNA where we can go digging through by computer, you know. So instead of digging up fossils, we, you know, with a pick and, and a hard hat, and um, yeah, we, we, we dig with a computer. And, and, going poking, poke, poke, poke through the genome of the computer to find these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.